Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Deborah Dobkins, the Dean of the Women's College at Brunel University, and it's my great pleasure today to welcome you to this Gold Series speaker event. Uh, the Gold Program is the signature program at the heart of the Women's College, and the word gold in this case is an acronym. G stands for Gender Awareness, O stands for Ownership of Personal and Civic Responsibility, L stands for Leadership, D stands for diversity and inclusion. And we are in the second year of the GOAL program, so this is our O year. And in this O year, our theme is own your voice, create your community. And we are delighted today to welcome a very illustrious guest whose career indeed reflects this theme. Um, I am delighted to be able to introduce to you today, Justice Leah Ward Sears. And I'm going to make my introduction of her very brief so that we can have more time hearing from her. You will have an opportunity to ask questions, uh, as you can see there in the webinar Q&A uh, box. So we'll be delighted to hear from you. We will field a few questions later in the day. Um, so, Justice Sears has had a truly remarkable career. She is currently a partner in business litigation and appellate practice at Smith, Gambrell, and Russell, LLP. But before returning to private practice, she served for 17 distinguished years on the Georgia Supreme Court, including four years as Chief Justice. Now, this is a woman with many firsts to her credit, so I'm only going to list a few, and then you'll hear more of these as she tells her story. But Justice Sears was the first woman to serve on the Supreme Court, the first woman to serve as a Superior Court judge in Fulton County, and the first woman elected statewide in Georgia. Um, Justice Sears holds a bachelor's degree from Cornell, a JD from our very own Emory University, right down the street from where we all are today, and an LLM from the University of Virginia. She holds more honorary degrees than I could list in the time that we have, I believe. She has earned the highest accolades and awards in her field. She's been named Best, Georgia, uh, best Lawyer in Georgia, Georgia Super Lawyer for the past few years, just to name a few. She is also the subject of a biography entitled Seizing Serendipity by Rebecca Davis and is published by UGA Press. And a reviewer of this book noted that Justice Sears' life is taken straight from the pages of the history books. This is a woman who has made her mark on history and an indelible mark. So we are particularly proud and honored to welcome her today. I would also like to extend the warmest welcome to Justice Sears and to all of you from Brunel University President Ann Sclater, uh, who will be joining us. So without further ado, please join me. I guess on your end, it'll be sort of silent, but I'll applaud a bit in welcoming Justice Leah Ward Sears. Welcome, Justice Sears. Uh, you're, you're muted still, Justice Sears? How's How is that? Great. That's this perfect. Is this is technology. Technology. <laughs> I, I thought I was, I was doing was, was, was uh, thank, thank you, thank you, you for that gracious and flattering introduction. Uh, is there an echo or is that just me? Um, I can't hear it, but our tech people are on the line, so I'm going to ask Emily to double check on that for us. But you sound clear and great. Oh, excellent. I just don't want to. Well, what I want to do is talk for just a few minutes about leadership because I'm very, very into women becoming leaders. I think women uh, have always been leaders in this country. And uh, I want to see that continue, but I, I want to see it grow. And then during the Q&A session, I'm hoping that uh, we can talk more about my life, my story, which I find not as interesting, but some people find it very interesting. So I'm going to take a few minutes and talk first about uh, e leadership. Uh, each of you uh, on this call or this video represents and embodies the next generation of leaders in this country. And uh, around the screen, I, I believe, and I've been up to Brunel a couple of times, I know we're in good hands. 
So today, as I said, I'd like to talk about leadership. More specifically, I want to, to tell you what I learned as Chief Justice of the highest court in Georgia about what it takes to be a, a great leader. And it's just not what I thought it was when I first started my journey professionally 42 years ago. So I'm gonna start with this, with this story. Before he died, Dave Thomas, who was the founder of Wendy's Fast Food Restaurant, became a familiar sight to millions with his company's television commercial. Dave also appeared in a lot of training films for Wendy's employees. And in those films, Dave often dressed as his workers dressed. He'd be wearing a, a Wendy's hat and an apron. And one year, he even appeared on the cover of his company's annual report dressed in a, a, a knee-length work apron holding a, a mop in a plastic bucket. You see, Dave never finished high school. He got a GED much later in life. And long before he went off on his own and started Wendy's, he worked his way up through the ranks of, 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 of Colonel Sanders' Kentucky Fried Chicken chain. Now, Dave Thomas was not unaccustomed to hard work. He used to say, I got my MBA long before I got my GED. But then the self-made millionaire would explain that MBA doesn't mean Masters of Business Administration. To him, it meant the mop, the bucket, and the attitude. Dave Thomas taught all his employees that service comes before success. He used to say that if anyone wants to be first, he or she must put him or herself last and become a servant. Because according to Dave Thomas, outstanding leadership is really a matter of being a servant. And I, I tend to agree with Dave. Over the 27 years that I was an elected judge and I went on the bench when I was only 27 years old, I learned that those who are great leaders serve others before themselves. In essence, that is what public officials are supposed to do. They are elected or appointed to serve the people. And to be a truly great leader, I believe you must serve a higher power or purpose than just yourself. Now, for me, that higher power is God. I've asked him to guide and direct me as I navigate the channels of my career and my life. But for others, this power may be uh, called by another name or it could be one's family or your country or a good cause that you serve. Regardless of where you are in your life's journey, I believe that being a great leader means nothing less than being guided by something more important than yourself. After all, in the end, I believe a well-lived life means that you have to serve something or someone. So ask yourself, who are you serving? Who or what is in charge of your life? The measure of a leader is not how many servants you have, but how many people you serve. Most of us have trouble understanding this, don't we? Especially when we're, we're young. We want to be served rather than to be served. We want to be the first. We want to be in front of the pack. But a great leader can turn the natural tendency most of us have to be first all the time, inside out and upside down. That is to say, a great leader knows that if you want to be first, you have to be willing to be last. If you're going to be on top, you have to be willing to be on the bottom. If you want to be the greatest, you sometimes have to be the least. That's the economics of truly great leadership. Now, there are five other things I've learned that I think great leaders do. Number one, great leaders lead by building relationships, not by coercion. Number two, great leaders lead by supporting other people, not by trying to control them. Number three, great leaders lead by developing others, not by doing all the work themselves. Number four, great leaders guide people. They don't drive people. Number five, great leaders lead from compassion, not from domination. 
I want to sum up this talk today before we get to the Q&A by telling you about a, an anonymous parable I read one day about a man named Ronald Sash. Ronald Sash had a significant but humble job in the offices of the largest company in the world. He worked, you see, as a mailroom clerk in the lowest reaches of that office building, doing what he could do to help other people with their jobs. Often he wondered what was happening on the floor just above his. He could hear a thousand footsteps every day and he would think of the exciting jobs other people must have been doing while he was relegated in the you know, working down in the basement. Then came a fateful day when Ronald found a dusty bottle on the mailroom floor. He picked it up, noticing the intricate inscription on the surface and began rubbing it hard in an effort to decipher what the word said. As Ronald rubbed and rubbed, a steaming smoke crept from the neck of the bottle. Now, many of you know how this story goes, but just go along with me anyway. When the smoke finally billowed and blew away, a remarkable and incredible figure appeared. It was a genie. The genie, sleepy and weary from scores of years of sleep, said to Ronald, your wish is my command. I will grant you three wishes. Ronald, feeling just a little skeptical, figured that even if he didn't get the wishes, a genie in a bottle could make him a lot of money. So he indulged the giant genie and said, well, I wish to be promoted to the next floor. The next day, Ronald's boss came in and told him that he was moving up to the next floor that very day. Ronald walked into the next floor's office like a conquering general. He was so very happy. But soon Ronald heard footsteps on the floor above him. So Ronald said to the genie, well, my second wish is to be promoted floor by floor until I reach the very top. I want to be in charge of this company. Done, said the genie, and floor by floor, Ronald moved his way through the ranks. 10th floor, 20th floor, 50th floor, 90th floor, and finally he made his way to the very top floor. Ronald was as high as he could go, chairman of the board, CEO of the company, corner office on the top floor of the building. But then one day, Ronald heard footsteps above him yet again. And then he saw a sign that it said stairs. So Ronald went up to the rooftop and there he found one of his clerks standing with his eyes closed. What are you doing, Ronald asked. I'm praying, came the answer. To whom, Ronald asked. Pointing a finger toward the sky, the young man answered, to my God. Panicked, gripped Ronald. He realized that there was a floor even above him. He couldn't see it. He couldn't hear the shuffling of feet. All he saw were clouds. So he asked his genie, do you mean there's an authority even higher than me? Ronald demanded to know from the genie. It was time now for Ronald's third and final wish. So Ronald asked of the genie, make me God, he said, make me the highest of all. Put me in the kind of position that only the highest power would hold if he were here on this earth. The very next day, Ronald sat awakened and he found himself in the basement, sorting the mail and doing what he could do to help others be the very best that they could be. And that's how Ronald Sash learned to be a great leader. For everyone in this virtual room today who aspires to be a leader like I did when I was your age, remember, that you will only be the first when you think of yourself last and become a servant of others. Now, I know that's not always an easy calling. At Smith, Gambrell, and Russell, where I now practice law, I often find myself, I'm sitting in my corner office, leading a smart team of appellate lawyers. And in that role, I'm finding that on most days, I'm really no different than Ronald Sash. I'm 
doing what I can to help others be the very best that they can be. I mean, in fact, that's what I'm doing right now. So as young leaders, you too must be willing to serve from the bottom up, to serve others and not just yourself, to serve a higher calling or purpose and not just yourself. With all that said, I just want to thank you all for the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. Best wishes to all my friends at Bernal and elsewhere who might be on this virtual call and in this virtual universe. Uh, Godspeed to you all, and again, I'm happy to have the opportunity to talk to you all, and I'm available for any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Justice Sears. Talk about the power of storytelling. A number of the folks participating today are first-year students who just participated in a master class with the Sullivan Foundation a couple of days ago about the power of storytelling to affect social change. And so I think you've just made very good use of that, that strategy today. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to ask a couple of follow-up questions and then I'm going to introduce a student leader who will share some questions from our participants. Okay. Um, Justice Sears, I know that you're a woman of many firsts and I only named a couple of them. Could you talk a little bit about one of your accomplishments in which you were the first to achieve something. Uh, tell us which of these firsts is perhaps most meaningful to you and why. Okay, well, honestly, Deborah, the, my biggest achievement, uh, and I guess I could say I was the first because I was the first to give birth to my particular son, blah, blah, while not the first to give birth. But being a, a wife and mother, while doing all of this stuff uh, has been a real significant achievement. It's not easy to be, I mean, as you know, I mean, as, as women who, who work outside the home know, uh, uh, to take care of your family, whatever your family configuration might be, and, and, and to make these accomplishments is, 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 is uh, significant because still, women still, carry, I think, the burden, the biggest burden, uh, at, at, in our homes, and then, and then we work. Like when I was on the Supreme Court, I was fairly young, because I got on the Supreme Court at only 36. My children were young. They were all, both under 10. And I would some days get in. I would drop my children off, make their breakfast, make their bed. I'm the only woman, I'm the only one doing all of that. I might have seen the governor for a meeting, and then I get to work. My mother's still living. She's 90 years old. I call her every morning. I've done all that. And yeah, right. I've done all that. And then I'm at work thinking about what I have to do for dinner. So it's still, I think, women still work more than one job. You know, whatever family you have, you know, most of them, you know, lets your you know, by yourself. So uh, being able to juggle all that, I think, has been my biggest achievement. But it's, it's something women do all over the world every day. So I'm not the first to do that. You might not be the first, but you certainly managed all of that, juggled all of that, to use right. your term, while accomplishing extraordinary things out in the world. And several things you've said, I think, really resonate. First of all, I think many of us would agree with you that it's got to be family first, right? Yes. Um, and then the career accomplishments often come later. Uh, or alongside and are perhaps even more precious because of all the things you did have to juggle in order right. to make that happen. That's right. uh, also, I just wanted to say you spoke about servant leadership, and this is something that's been in the DNA uh, of Bernal women since 1848, I think. Serving in the community, serving uh, while leading has been crucial to us. So um, what might you say to uh, some of the young women who are with us today 
um, who are thinking, well, I'd really like to become a leader, but I don't know how in the world a person juggles all of that. Or somebody who's thinking, I'd really like to get involved to make a difference in my community. And I know that this is something you continue to do while serving on boards um, and being involved with charities and other organizations to try to help make our world a better place, frankly. So what advice might you have for women's college students who think, I really want to make a difference, but I'm just one person. What could I possibly do? Oh, one person can make a, a huge, huge difference. Oh. Uh, what I did, I mean, it really, all it takes sometimes is just one person, one person with a little bit more courage, one person who's willing to do what somebody else is not going to do, one person can save it, a, a child's life who might be floundering, uh, one little whisper into the ear. I mean, I've spoken to people who I didn't know needed, you know, but I, I said a little bit of something to them on a day they needed it. And it, it to, I, it, they came back saying, you, it changed everything for me. I didn't know that. So, uh, you know, you be, you're, if you're kind to people, make an effort to do that every day. And also you just st start from the, the bottom up. I didn't start on the Supreme Court. I started working in people's campaigns going from house to house, handing out literature, uh, talking to people, stuffing envelopes for other people and uh, other politicians. I mean, that's how I got up my first judgeship. Andrew Young, I was stuffing envelopes in, uh, for Andrew Young when he was in his 40s running for mayor of the city of Atlanta, just going in there, passing it. So I got to know him and when he became mayor, uh, he decided I should be uh, go to the traffic court. I, I, you know, so that's how I started. You know, uh, if that's all it takes is just you know little by little by little consistently. Yeah, I used to love this book called The Little Engine That Could. I don't know if it's still popular, but my mother used to read it to me. It's I think I can. I think I can. I just little steps and the little engine. The little caboose back there did more than the steam engine and the other engines and all the other engines. It's just persistence and just grinding away. You look around one day and you've done it. One step at a time, right? One, one step small time. step, possibly one kindness, one word of encouragement. Right. Um, and, and I'm really interested in hearing what you have to say about starting out by stuffing envelopes. Uh, you know, uh, very few people start out at the top, as your stories illustrate. Right. And we all have to start somewhere. Right. And so to know that you were doing your best to encourage other people to participate in their own civic responsibilities, to participate in, in the democratic process, really, it, it sounds like that's what got you on the road to judgeship. Yeah. Right? I was, wasn't thinking I'm going to get a judge. Now, I've, I've always been political. Not that I was going to run for office, but I, you know, look, I'm, I'm black, African-American, and female. And I was born, I'm 65 now. I was born in 1955. So I, got, I had, if I wanted to be something, I knew I had a ways to go. I mean, when I was born, women could be... Uh, most women were uh, worked inside the home, were nurses or teachers. And I didn't really want to, my mother was a teacher. She was a great teacher, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do other things. That's the gender problem. The big, you know, my, everyone thought, my parents thought, uh, you know, I should go to Spelman or nice, you know, nice college and, and marry a guy from Morehouse and wear pearls. That was what I was supposed to do, and I didn't want to do that either. Um, so not nothing wrong with Spelman or pearls. I'm wearing some very nice ones now, but I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. And they were, you know, their their vision for me, which would have been a nice life for somebody if I marry a doctor and all that, but it just wasn't for me, and I knew that. So uh, I was political, but. Uh, I, I knew that change needed to be made. 
and so I knew that if I got the guy elected mayor who I liked, uh, he could make change. I didn't think the change was going to involve me necessarily, like get a judgeship. I just thought he thought more like I did. It would be good, and let's you know he had daughters. He had, and I and his daughters. One went to law school. So he was probably a pretty good guy, and I'm just going in that direction. So that's how I did. Well, and I think for you to put this in historical context is very important for our listeners to understand uh, what women, what people of color uh, were particularly up against right. in this time. And so, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that you are also the first African American Chief Justice of any state Supreme Court. No, African American, right? a first African American woman, woman Chief Justice of any state court. Like on my bench, Bob Benham, a black man from Cartersville, was there before I me. Mean, it tended to be uh, one black on any state Supreme Court, if there were. One at once, and the black tended to be a man, and so I and I was told that you know when uh, I was applying, Governor Miller appointed me. Uh, I was told, well, we already have Bob Benham, so what? You don't need to apply. That that the state had its black, and I and I and that's it. You know there was a token black, and that was that, and I applied anyway, and people said, you're wasting your time. But obviously, Sal Miller didn't feel that. And uh, so I went in there. I went into the, the uh, interview with him very comfortable because I had been told I'm not going to get it anyway. So we had a very pleasant chat. I was comfortable. <laughs> and as I was about to leave his office, he pulled me back and said, listen, if I can't appoint you this time, please keep applying because I liked you. You know, so I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he calls three or four weeks later. I thought he was going to tell me he liked me, but try again. And he said, I'm appointing you to the Supreme Court. I was, I was floored. But that's the power of don't listen, you know, not listening to people when you, you got to try it. You know, no pain, no gain. If you don't try it, sure, you're, if, you're, if your resume is not in the stack, it can't get picked up. You got to go, you've got to take the risk. You have to have courage. Absolutely right. You have to have courage. And right. I would just say to our listeners to imagine the kind of courage it took to know that you had multiple things stacked against you and to be told openly, oh, no, there's already one black person and that's plenty. Right. I think it's probably pretty shocking to the ears of our students today to imagine that something like that was not only pretty openly practiced, but was quite directly stated. Yeah. Oh, and these were some of the people who were telling me are black, were black. You know, that's just, they would, had just kind of gotten resigned to, this is what they do. They put uh, one woman on, and the woman is, is white, and they put one black on, and the got black is, 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 uh, is a man, and that's it. You're done for. But no one's ever put a black woman on, or any woman of color. So when I came trotting along, it was like a big shock, you know, to people. And it was a shock to me, honestly. But, and then the other thing was I was only 36. All my colleagues were in their late 50s and 60s. So I go bouncing up there, you know, and it, it was like, wow. It was very different. But since then, there have been much younger judges, uh, people of color, uh, all kinds of brown people and uh, Asians, I mean, the, it's really, it's changed, but that's not what it was in 1990. All the courts were all white men, period. All white men, no women in it. Okay, you hear that, don't you, students? <laughs> I mean, it, it's just shocking, really, still shocking, I think, in many ways, and I think your story also shows the, the importance of being true to yourself, being your authentic self, following the path that you feel led to follow, not just what everybody tells you is not possible. Because right. if you had listened only to what people told you was possible, um, 
Your name would be history books. Nothing would ever change. That's right. Nothing would ever change. And um, this is one of the things that we've been trying to talk with our students a lot about in terms of the theme of owning your voice. One is we all have a voice. We probably don't need to find it, but we do need to learn how to use it wisely and well. And um, we've been encouraging students to register to vote, to educate themselves about the issues, um, and to be prepared to make their voice count as they vote. And I just want to give a little plug to all of our students who are listening. You can watch your Canvas shell, or sorry, your Canvas dashboard, and you'll see some links for registering to vote and checking to make sure that you're registered to vote and what to do if you need an absentee ballot and so forth. So I just want to put that out there to remind people that one voice matters. And that our votes and our voices can indeed affect positive change. And you have certainly exemplified that. And I wanted to just ask you one more question before I shift over okay. to Mel Riley, who's with us today. So I would think that it took a fair amount of courage to do what you did. I would imagine, if I had to guess, and hearing how you're describing the circumstances, I'm going to doubt that every single person welcomed you with wide open arms and thought, oh, here she is, this young whippersnapper, she's gonna help us change the system. So say a little bit about what that was like to find yourself in that sort of um, work situation where it's dominated by older people, by men, uh, all white men. Yeah, well, plus Bob Bennett. Well, yes, yeah, sorry. But, okay, but. It was uh, honestly very stressful. And I, I, it was extremely stressful. And some of it, I didn't realize how stressful it was until they appointed, uh, Governor Miller appointed a woman the next time after me, the next appointment. And I went into my bathroom. We all each had a bathroom in our chambers. And I just started crying. And it was like all coming out. I had just spent a year just holding, holding on, holding on. Because some of the things that were said, some of the, and you, you know, so just some of the, you know, they would, people would listen to you. Uh, you would use your voice, but they would ignore your voice. Uh, there were some people who were very kind to me. I mean, what, um, uh, one judge took me aside and said, you know, I've been listening to what you have to say, and you really have a lot to say. And you, although some didn't, you know, uh, I remember one judge just got up and said, you're too young to be here. You know, you don't know what the war is. And I was like, I know the war, but you're talking about like World War II. Like my war was like Vietnam or, you know, but, you know, but anyway, we, um, uh, it was stressful. And uh, it took a while for the court to evolve to where more people like me uh, came on, a little bit more progressive thinking, a little bit more, a little bit younger, because uh, the court was quite old. I mean, it was, you know, some pe many people in their 70s, and there's a difference between 70 and 36. But if you get people coming on in their 40s, 45, 50, it just, I could, I could suddenly breathe. And mm -hmm. they were just open to new ideas, you know, a new world. And it just made it, I, I felt, felt the pressure easing up. Well, I can certainly say uh, that we're all very glad that you persevered um, and that I know it took a lot of grit and determination to do that. And I, I'm sure that uh, the choices were not always easy. Um, and my choice to shift over to Mel Riley isn't easy because I have a million questions that I'd like to ask. But I'd like to at this time introduce Marella Riley, who is a senior studio art major and a theater minor. Mel is also a Tiger tutor and a Brunel scholar. And she has many other uh, uh, titles to her credit, but we're delighted that Mel could join us today. She's been watching the Q&A. And so I'm going to turn it over to Mel to let her uh, share some of these questions with Justice Sears. Okay. Hello, um, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Your um, views on leadership have been so inspiring for me at least. Um, and for everyone here, I'm sure. 
if anyone has any questions for Justice Sears, feel free to put them in the Q&A box, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, I'm going to start this off quick so we can get to, to a few of the questions here. Um, can you speak about the importance of mentors in your career? Were any of them win women, and did that matter? Uh, well, most of my, well, of course, my mom was a mentor. I had teachers that were mentors. Uh, yeah, it mattered. Uh, you know, women see the world in the, with, in it, through a different lens that we don't all see the world the same way, by the way. But, we, you know, it's, there is a difference be, between men and women. And uh, sometimes I just need, even now, I need the company of women to just feel, ah, to be with, I, you know, I'm in a sorority, I'm an AKA. And so I just, oh God, on the weekends to go and, and to be with them. I'm a, what's called a link. I'm in women's organization all the time. And I'm in a little women's coffee club. Uh, but there were many uh, men who were mentors who helped me, uh, help me, and many were judge mentors who helped me hone my craft, taught me professionalism. And so in, in some ways, even though I'm a little bit, I'm younger for uh, somebody with as much experience as I have, particularly as a jurist, but I have sort of old ways about me sometimes because I was taught by these, you know, great, older judges, I mean, I'm like 35, and they're like 70. So I use uh, some of their skills. I believe in professionalism, sort of old fashioned ways of getting things done. But I can Zoom and text and all that kind of stuff, okay? LOL and all that, <laughs> okay? That's great. Um... Uh, another one here that I found really interesting is, what do you think have been the most significant legal rulings for women and people of color in your lifetime? Oh, okay, I was born in, in 55. So I, Brown was 54. Brown versus Board of, it's around the same time. I keep forgetting whether it was 54 or 56. But the Brown versus Board of Education decision was massive that basically uh, uh, stopped segregation. That, that is the beginning of integration in, in public facilities. And I, uh, I remember when that, that hit, my parents knew they were having children at the time because they had children in 54, 55, and 56. That's what, how parents had children back then. And they thought, um, oh, goodness, my children will not be relegated to all segregated schools. And in fact, we were not. Uh, or they won't have to grow up the way we did. And we did not. So Brown versus Board of Education. And in terms of gender, uh, uh, the right to vote, but that was in the 20s. That's before my time. I would say Roe versus, uh, Board of, uh, Roe versus Wade for me, because I had just started college when that hit. I didn't even know uh, it was, I was on a subway in New York. I went to Cornell uh, up in upstate. I, but I was down in the city and I was with the, on a uh, train and I was like, oh my goodness, uh, we have to be careful uh, about our sexuality because if we get pregnant, we're done for. And I, my friend said, haven't you heard of Roe versus Wade? The Supreme Court just gave us a choice. So you have had a choice. And I was like, wow. And that, uh, that freed, you know, to those women who go that way, uh, who might use that as an option that gave many, many women uh, the options, uh, gave so many of us options that we didn't have. Those were two, but there have been a ton of them. You asked for two. Thank you so much. Um, I'm looking through. There's incredibly, there's so many great questions here. Um, uh, one I would like to say is, uh, what advice would you give to our women's college students on how to use their voice today? What would you tell them? Um, speak up. Uh, don't be afraid to speak up. Uh, uh, too many women, you, may, you don't experience this because you're at an all women's 
college, but too many women, like at the school I went to, they sit in the back, uh, let the men do all the talking, defer to men. Uh, the, the, uh, women do too much deferring to men. And you can't do that and become a great leader. Uh, I don't know if it's to be cute or we think they're smarter or what have you, but it's not cute deferring to men. The kind of men, man I wanted always was the kind of man that would not, that, that could handle me. Uh, everyone else should go look elsewhere. That's, that was my position. Um, so it didn't do, I was always myself. And if you can't handle that, then just keep on strutting. At least that was a term they used to use back, back in the day. Uh, and, and I used my views, I spoke up. And I think uh, speaking up is, is attractive to the right kind of people. Great, thank you. Um, has any case or event ever challenged your views and valued or possibly changed or altered your perspective? And how did you adapt and overcome to having your views challenged either in a personal or professional setting? Hmm. Well, if, if you'll get the book, which I did not write, by the way, that I, this was a biography written by a woman. I was the in the forefront at the court on LGBTQ issues. And uh, I don't know, I, I think I put that, that fight, which is what I saw it as, and I was the only jurist on the court who saw it as, a, I saw it as a civil rights issue, just as I saw it as, uh, you know, uh, race and gender as a civil rights issue. I saw it the same. I, and uh, I, I had to, I was always in the forefront. It took me a minute to get to the uh, same sex marriage thing. I was never against it. It just took me, I had to balance it with my faith uh, kind of thing and all that and, because I'm a very big marriage person. Uh, so, but, but I got there. So, and we were doing the cases at the same time. So I was learning while I was doing the cases. And I took a lot of heat for some of the opinions. You can read it in the book. I took a lot of heat. Uh, but now everybody's on board and they've forgotten how tough that, that was a tough fight for a long time. I think you're on. Yeah. I, okay. I <laughs> That's okay. Hey, I was too with the stars. Um, so, um, do you think that gender and racial diversity is important for the court system, particularly in the Supreme Court? And Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, because I think, you know, we're, we sit as a kind of a board, and as many views as we can get, as many, uh, you know, like I like to say, people see life differently through different lens, and the lens is their experience, and the more... Uh, we can bring that to bear at the table, the more we'll understand. I mean, if it's just all white guys sitting at the table, we just may as well just have one judge. You know, the more, the, the more we have, the more we understand, the more we get educated, the better the opinion. It's absolutely critical. Definitely. Um, thank you so much. Um, uh, I've gotten a couple of variants of this question. Uh, would you please share the name of a book or another piece of literature that has influenced you? Hmm. Well, you know, I read all the time the influence. I'm just reading all the time. Uh, well, you know, and I read a lot of poetry. So, so I, uh, a book, one book that influenced me. You know, there was, I, I, don't, I don't know how to explain this, but there was a book, and I don't even know why it influenced me, but there was a book a while back, I've got, forgotten the author, that called The Red, the Red Room uh, that had a profound impact uh, on me. Or red, it could have been The Red Tent. It was where women 
a long time ago used to have to be relegated to when they were on their menstrual cycles. And just reading about women being relegated, and I just picked it up and couldn't stop reading. I think it's called The Red Tent. That was uh, extremely important to me. Uh, uh, I've been reading a lot of uh, race-based books now. Uh, uh, how to be uh, a sort of an ally to black people. I've forgotten the name of the book. But, uh, gosh, White uh, Fragility is actually the last book I read. It's a tough book. I mean, it is a tough book, but I wanted, but I noticed that it, that it was, uh, I couldn't get it on Amazon, so I, and it's on, it, it's on the New York Times bestseller list, and my best, I have a very good friend who's a Jewish woman who was trying to understand what was going on as we were going through this whole black racial reckoning thing, and so she got in a little uh, uh, group with some, some of her white friends, and they got some books together, and Rebecca told me you should read uh, 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 White, oh, oh, I forgot the name of it, White uh, Fragility, and I did read it. It's, it's a tough book to read if you're white, uh, but it's worth, I think it's worth reading just to sort of balance out. I don't agree with it 100%, but it does show you where systemic racism and all that. That is so. Look, I'm always reading books, and now that I figured out that uh, 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 Amazon Prime has Audible, and I've been able to use my Audible once I go around riding to and from work, listening to books now. And the last one of the last books I'm reading is called Cast. Called Cast. That's a book I'm halfway through. Audible, and I. Uh, I'm reading the little Megan and Harry story. I love all that kind of thing. Uh, uh, finding friends or free, finding freedom. Finding freedom. So I read all different kinds of books. Okay? Okay. That's great. Okay. <laughs> Someone said something really interesting here. Um, you are a blueprint for not only your own children, but for minority students all over the world. And is there a point that you realize this? Is there a point, point in time where you realize that other people would be looking to you for, for guidance and advice? Yes, I took a couple of things. I was, I, I'm good friends, very good friends with Paula Wallace, who's the president of SCAD. I'm from Savannah. And we, I watched her grow SCAD, Savannah College Art and Design. And I was at a program for her down in Savannah, where I'm from. And this little girl came up to uh, shake my hand. She was this little, little, eight years old. And she started crying and shaking my hand. And I was like, gosh, it's just me. What, I, I can't, you know, like I was like, wow. And I like bent down and I, I gave her a hug. I didn't know I had that kind of impact on a little girl. Uh, this was years ago, but I was beginning to think then, uh, I have to be careful, like how I look, what I say, where, because I'm having an impact on all these young women. Another instance, I was at the Braves game when the Braves were at Turner Field and I was eating a hot dog and this woman wanted to shake my hand and I got really annoyed because uh, I was just there for the game. And, uh, and my husband took me aside and said, look, uh, you have become something. If anyone wants to shake your hand, you're not just you anymore, although you are, but take the time to shake their hand because uh, uh, that matters to them. And I didn't realize it. Uh, I just didn't. So now, you know, I, I'm, I'm just more careful. And if, you know, if anyone's listening who was at that Graves game, I'm sorry. And then the other thing is, I was walking on the belt line, and this, you know, God, I had on little skinny, you know, the little spandex pants that everyone wears, a little zip-up thing. I had a hat on, and this uh, other woman lawyer came up to be black, and 
she said, it's just as serious. That's you. That's just as serious. And she came up to me. This was before the pandemic and kissed me here and here. And I was like, oh, my God. Uh, oh, it's nice. You know, so I, I, I've gotten it. It's touching. I mean, it's really touching, uh, you know. That's amazing. Um, I think we're out of time for the oh. questions. Okay. Um, but thank you so much for speaking for speaking on all of this. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Mel, for uh, fielding the questions for us. And um, I think that you've all just heard a masterclass uh, here in how to persevere, how to stay humble, how to serve others. And if you'd like to learn more about Justice Sears, you can certainly read her biography, her profile that's on our website, brunow.edu backslash gold. Uh, you'll see information there. And if you'd really like to have your mind blown, you can read her Wikipedia entry. It <laughs> describes all of the legislation, her rulings and so forth. Um, and I'm really excited to say that we are going to give away a copy of her bio of the biography of Justice Sears called Seizing Serendipity. I can't wait to get my hands on my own copy and I'm delighted we're gonna be able to give that away. And if we had a little bit more time, one of the questions that I think uh, I'd like to hear Justice Sears say more about is what that felt like to be the subject of a biography. And when we spoke briefly about this yesterday, she said that her primary concern was that her mother would be pleased and not distracted by anything and by all accounts her mother's very pleased and very proud and naturally she she would be so um, before we all disband I'm delighted to say that uh, we're going to do a couple of drawings and my colleague Tracy Moore who's assistant director of development programs is going to manage for us um, a random drawing. We're going to give away not only the copy of Seizing Serendipity, and isn't that a great title? I want to buy it just based on the title alone. That's terrific. Um, she's also going to give away two t-shirts designed by our very own Sophia Casey, in which she created these shirts to uh, for a fundraiser to raise some money for the Student Emergency Fund. So take it away, Tracy. Absolutely. Thank you so much to Justice Sears. Uh, we really appreciate the, uh, your crucial perspective and it's been just a delight to have you. Um, and we're also always thankful to all of you for joining us today and the Bernal community for their support. We did want to say uh, just before the raffle, build suspense, uh, that if you're enjoying these events and you'd like to support the GOLD program uh, to ensure the success and continuation of the historic Women's College, uh, you can do so and support a cause of your choice at giving.bernal.edu. And you can also visit supporting.bernal.edu for um, all of our departments that are doing their own fundraisers and opportunities, uh, specific projects, as well as the fundraiser that Dr. Dobkins mentioned uh, prior. Uh, one of our unique fundraisers, the uh, Emergency Student Assistance Fund, aids and helps students continue their studies after the uh, challenges of this year. And we were so thankful to Sophia. I have one of the shirts here to show you all. This is what we're gonna be raffling off today. So this is Sophia's uh, original design of the front of Brunel campus, probably looks familiar, uh, and it also has the words love deeply, fear nothing, hate never. It's not super clear there, but uh, that's a line from our Bernal ideal. Uh, Dr. Dobkins had the foresight to snag a bunch of these because these were one of our limited availability fundraising merchandise. And uh, currently our mask fundraiser is going on if anyone wants to go, uh, like I mentioned, to supporting for that. So without further ado, uh, the winners of the two shirts for uh, this raffle are Kella Busby and Carly Cox. Uh, we took a, a raffle of all of the participants. Kala and Carly, we will make sure to email you all after the event uh, to get the information in, uh, from you and we'll get you your shirts to you. Without further ado, we also want to make sure that we raffle off uh, a copy of Seizing Serendipity, the biography of Justice Sears by Rebecca Davis. Uh, our winner for Seizing Serendipity is Jonella Wells. So Jonella, we'll make sure to email you as well uh, about getting you your copy of the book. I know that we're all looking forward to it uh, once we get our copies just this year. It's been a delight. Uh, thank you all so much. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much, Tracy. And Absolutely. And congratulations to the recipients of these gifts. I know that you're going to enjoy them. And as soon as our person gets her copy of the book, we've got to sit down and talk about it and ask Justice Sears more questions. Um, I think that you've all today experienced 
more history in the making in that we have learned uh, valuable lessons. We've gotten some important insight about leadership, about being a true servant leader from a woman who has blazed many, many trails. And we are indeed fortunate and grateful to her for spending her time with us today. And I would be remiss if I did not thank my colleague, Dr. Ken Frank, who introduced uh, Justice Sears to Brunel. And that also reminds me that I want to let everybody know that Dr. Frank will be leading two workshops coming up in the next couple of weeks. I believe the first one is on September 29th. He will lead one session on conflict resolution and one session on mediation. So those are free and available to all of you. Just check out the Gold Program calendar of events and you'll see the link there and you can register for those workshops. So don't miss that. Um, but again, I just can't thank Justice Sears enough for being with us today. I wish we had two more hours. There are so many things I want to ask you and talk about and I hope that you will um, uh, see your way clear to join us again another day for a conversation and I, I'm so thankful to you and we are all grateful to you for your service and for the strides you've made um, not only for women but for people of color and frankly for justice in America and we um, we will be forever in your debt. So thank you again, Justice Sears, and I'll ask everybody, all of our participants, to join me in a bit of a silent round of applause. So thank you again, and thanks to everybody who joined us today for the Gold Series speaker, Justice Leah Ward Sears. Trailblazer, thank you again. Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>